Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here, and I think we have an interesting topic for you today. I can call it one of the leading topics of probably uh, the past few years, and certainly uh, I think represents much of the future of agility in general. So with that, I'll get into it. First of all, a brief introduction about myself. Uh, the name's Arlen Bankston, one of the two co-founders and owners of Lightspeed, a consultancy in the Herndon, Virginia area, and uh, also the Agile Leadership Academy, which is an executive uh, training and support program for uh, Agile leaders or people who are hoping to be so. Uh, and I've been in the Agile space quite a long time. Uh, the benefit of this being that I've seen applications of this uh, in many different areas across industries, across business functions, uh, and so I hope to bring a bit of that to bear here in this webinar. Uh, with no further ado, let's, uh, let's dive into it. I'd like to begin with uh, an ever so brief origin story, if you will, or at least a few notes to that effect. Uh, as it so happens, Agile methods uh, really didn't start with software development. If you, uh, if you truly dig into the roots of things, uh, they were inspired by practices in lots of other areas. Uh, very notably, uh, manufacturing, inst uh, interestingly enough, for those of you familiar with the industrial age, uh, you had a, an ongoing mechanization and separation of uh, worker skill sets, of uh, operations and ways that people did things, of, of physical machines into faster, more dedicated, more specialized uh, but, you know, machinery. And uh, eventually, and in Japan in particular, the automotive industry there recognized that they had a, a set of challenges, uh, many of which arose somewhat obviously from uh, World War II, but they were trying to rebuild their uh, industrial infrastructure and decided to take a, a bit of a different tack from the way that manufacturers and much of the rest of the world were doing things. Uh, and these, the idea of doing things in smaller batches with more cross-functional teams, uh, have checking quality all along the way, uh, building in the cultural waste reduction uh, sort, of, sort of ideas. All of these things really started there uh, at, at primarily Toyota, which is the, the place where the word lean eventually got coined to describe their uh, production system. Uh, you know, you fast forward and methods like Kanban, which is uh, really, I, I think at this point, still less than a decade old or right around there, uh, that also was a derivation of some of those uh, inventory management practices in particular there. Uh, similarly, uh, daily scrums are, uh, from, from Scrum of course, our daily stand-ups, the equivalent in XP, uh, had a number of various sources actually, but uh, one of the ones that Jeff Sutherland, for instance, uh, one of the inventors of Scrum noted, uh, was this idea that uh, at MIT people would have daily meetings to keep track of, what, of the projects they were doing. Uh, that that same inspiration was true for doing uh, demonstrations every weeks or every week or thereabouts uh, to try to get feedback both internally from a team and externally from customers. Uh, a lot of the idea of having cross-functional small teams to begin with, uh, there, there are actually many different origins for this, uh, but the broad-based uh, theor theoretical foundation there is known as knowledge worker theory uh, and, and so on, right? And if you kind of fast forward today, I think the whole uh, organizational development paradigm uh, underlies quite a bit of what you'll see in the approaches taken in agile coaching, consulting, and transformational efforts where you're trying to look at things uh, less at a team level and more at a systematic and organizational level. Uh, so all this kind of leads you to the conclusion that in fact uh, while a lot of these, uh, a lot of the particular practices that you might choose, things like uh, you know, let's say test-driven development, uh, like pair programming, uh, certain specific practices like that may or may not apply in different domains. Some of them are, uh, you know, fairly software-specific, uh, although th those, <laughs> those two in particular actually could also be applied elsewhere. Uh, but almost across the board, the core principles that underlie these things, uh, they both started elsewhere and now they're being applied elsewhere. Uh, so moving on, just a few quick examples, and we'll dive into uh, a number of others as we go along here. You're seeing this used both across business functions, and by this I mean, uh, you know, sales, marketing, product development, and so on, uh, and actually industrial domains. So you're seeing quite a lot of usage of, of these principles and ideas in education. Uh, this is happening uh, quite a lot in Europe, uh, in the Netherlands in particular, uh, is where many of the efforts started and continue. Uh, you're also seeing it uh, here locally in our backyard out in Washington, D.C., a number of applications of these ideas. 
Uh, some colleagues of ours from uh, the Venerable Capital One have actually been out uh, helping some schools and to some, some children to adopt these practices at a classroom level. So it's, uh, it's nothing new, but it's certainly a rapidly spreading notion. And uh, a lot of the core agile things you would expect to see, the small teams, the uh, kind of emergent leadership uh, ideas, the ideas of, of uh, students, for instance, planning out their own days, all of these are present. Uh, it's scrum task boards, daily scrums, you name it. Um, similarly, you see this in, in very high-level industrial applications. So some of, uh, some of some of the companies that I've worked with out in Europe, for instance, have uh, been dealing with companies like Siemens. Uh, you know, obviously, no no small fry there. Uh, or, or ASML, which does a very very complicated high-end uh, laboratory equipment, more or less. And so you you, you can find some interesting papers to that effect uh, in WikiSpeed. Some of you may have heard of the. Founder of that, Joe Justice, now works for Jeff Sutherland at Scrum Inc., and he had, was the keynote at one of the Agile conferences a few years back, uh, using its principles to build cars, to build uh, portable housing, and a number of other things uh, under the banner of WikiSpeed. Uh, and then Jim Benson, uh, who had worked with David Anderson to uh, initially uh, launch Kanban as an, as an industry method. He was one of the uh, early leaders in that area. Uh, has since moved into using that for uh, you know, running the things you do at home. So making sure that your children do their homework and making sure that the lawn gets mowed and you clean out your garage every once in a while. So it's a matter of uh, trying to focus and trying to visualize the work to keep people from getting overwhelmed. So you see a lot of these ideas uh, very easily spread about. And with this, I'd like to get into kind of the heart of things. Namely, uh, first of all, let's look across the domains. Uh, if you're thinking about inside a, a classical enterprise, Prize. You've, of course, got a lot of different business functions. Uh, the visual that you're seeing here is essentially my uh, admittedly not incredibly scientific uh, overview of where I've seen these methods penetrate uh, just simply across my clientele and companies I'm familiar with. So you're seeing here, for instance, of course, that uh, in software development, it is uh, obviously nothing new, though, though I'd say still it's not quite the majority at this point. Uh, most companies are at least trying agile methods, but there are not all that many uh, percentage-wise that have done it wholesale and do this for all of their projects uh, and really is just the default method. Similarly, the very rapid rise of DevOps uh, is a sign that this is becoming increasingly common and uh, I, I would say virtually necessary in, in operational areas. Um, you're seeing things like beyond budgeting, uh, sort of a, a bit of a splinter movement of, of agilists who are dealing with finance. Uh, trying to take these principles and saying, uh, trying to take these principles and apply them to the way that companies actually do budgeting, uh, fund projects, and track their and, and manage their spend in, in general. Um, I am, as it so happens, just finishing up a book called The Agile Leader's Guide to HR, uh, and I'm seeing more and more uh, efforts in, in the HR sector, and I've got a few case studies that effect, and so on here, right? Just, so just short of showing you that. Uh, in every single one of these areas, I've at least seen a few examples of Agile methods being applied and uh, almost uniformly to relatively good effect uh, in areas where you would not normally expect to see them. So uh, with that, I wanted to launch a little poll and just get a sense of how many of you have in fact uh, you know, seen these methods applied outside of your classical software development area. Um, and this could either be in, uh, as I said, business functions like HR marketing and so on, uh, or this could be in somewhat uh, different domains where it's being used not for software development, but say to run uh, you know, a classroom at a, at a school or the like. Um, so, and uh, as you guys are looking at that, I'll give just a moment or two. So, um, okay, and as those are coming in, I will, begin to proceed here. Still waiting well, on just a couple would more I like folks. A couple more folks? Okay. I'll give it just a moment. Ah, yes. So the poll is showing here that uh, fully more than half of you have, have seen the application of these in other areas. Um, and this is certainly a good thing for uh, agile consultancies like mine. You know, it uh, sort of shows that these, this is 
the sort of thing that, that really has no narrow focus at all. It, given that it was birthed in many different areas and that it continues to grow there, uh, I, you know, I think it points to a very rich future for, for these methods in general, lean and agile alike. Uh, and so to this end, the, uh, much of the remainder of this presentation, what I'd like to do is introduce a few simple ideas. Um, you, you'll see different people taking a crack at this notion of uh, trying to simplify agility, right? Trying to move it away from a lot of very specific practices and very strictured methodologies uh, and up to a broader series of, of really thinking tools uh, that, that you can apply across the board. Uh, you'll see things like modern agile that uh, takes a similar tack of, of trying to really simplify uh, the, the notions. So this is my effort at it. Um, and I've, I basically boiled things down to five core ideas. Uh, understand value. The idea there is to know exactly what's important before you begin uh, pursuing a solution space. Uh, so it's a lot around understanding the problem, understanding your customers, uh, a lot of the ideas behind methods like the Lean Startup, design thinking, and so on. Uh, think big, build small. So we've classically had very large, long-scale projects, and people try to, well, finish them, uh, start them and finish them. This is the idea that many things never finish, uh, that we always should, of course, take the long view, think strategically. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the more that we can deliver consistently and tactically and rapidly, uh, the more that we can, well, get, get feedback, which is the next bit of it. Um, we need to make sure we're getting feedback both internally uh, from our teams, from our stakeholders, uh, and externally from our customer bases, making sure the things we're delivering are useful. Uh, working together, uh, small cross-functional teams, uh, getting people in particular across uh, you know, uh, various phases, various departments, various groups, uh, getting them to reduce handoffs between one another and lighten those and make operations more uh, parallel and concurrent rather than serialized and separated. Uh, and lastly, the notion of trying to be more transparent, um, trying to make sure that the work we're doing is visible uh, to ourselves, for, uh, first and foremost, uh, out of sight, out of mind, of course, uh, and also to our stakeholders so that uh, there's uh, less of a need for things like big, long meetings and uh, large, complicated reporting structures. Uh, so with this, let's let's dive in one at a time here and, and sort of see what we're talking about. Uh, I'll start with the oldest of the case studies that I, I'm bringing up here. This is one uh, that emerged, it was written up in the Harvard Business Review back in 2003. Uh, Jefferson Pilot was a, a financial company, an insurance company basically, that uh, had initially a fairly classic process, I would say. They would get in applications and process them internally uh, and eventually you know, ship them back and say, hey, you're, you're approved or you're not. Um, oftentimes you had some, some rework to be done, not, not a huge amount, uh, but enough to slow things down and leave it in fact at a, a fairly lengthy, lengthy time frame there uh, that as you see had fairly high variability. And a lot of the, the core problem here was uh, navel gazing, that this, this company basically was looking at things primarily from their internal, internal perspective. Uh, once things actually arrived at the processing center, that's when the clock started. That's when managers started considering, uh, you know, how good or bad the process was based on the duration from then to when they sent it out. But the problem was there was time being taken both prior to that and following that, uh, that particular time frame. And of course, while internally this may not have made much of an impact, the customers noticed. So they did something uh, that you see a lot of companies doing today. They took the customer's perspective, uh, looked at the journey, so to speak, that the customer was uh, setting upon. And by doing this, they were able to take much more a holistic view of all of the steps in the process. Uh, and essentially through a combination of value stream mapping and some other ideas of that nature, were able to take it and uh, dramatically reduce the, the overall time of processing, especially from the customer's perspective. Uh, so now they're looking at it uh, kind of an, as an end-to-end -end situation, and that allowed them to visualize things much more prominently. Um, and you notice I noted a few things there. Uh, the idea of customer journeys, um, looking at uh, experience mapping, the ideas of uh, design thinking. Th these are a lot of very specific instantiations of this core idea. Uh, you also see that it's this notion at the very heart of lean methods. Uh, if you look into uh, ideas like lean process improvement, uh, value, flow, and waste are the three most important things in that order, right? So uh, until you understand what's truly valued by your customer, 
Uh, you cannot optimize your process by eliminating unnecessary steps, uh, by lining up the processes more precisely. Uh, it all starts there, and if you get that wrong, the rest of it's going to be wrong. So this is really, uh, it, it's a simple thing to say, but still many companies get this wrong. You make guesses about what's important, uh, but you're not, you're not making sure that they're uh, the proper guesses, and you're proceeding, therefore, on incorrect assumptions. So looking at the notion of, of value streams, uh, kind of bringing this way up to the big picture, if you look at the most uh, radical instantiations of that, this idea, it is in the transformation of companies from dealing with projects uh, that are kind of one-off things that, that are, you know, where you have to form teams around them and you have to budget specifically around them and everything really rotates and centers around this uh, project construct. Uh, moving into more of the idea of ongoing, uh, ever-living, ever-evolving value streams where uh, that's the way teams are aligned. Uh, that's the way your processes are aligned. That uh, often this talk, this is about breaking down silos between various departments, between product development, uh, operations, uh, marketing, sales, finance, all of them. And uh, trying to create essentially cross-functional organizations that, that are, again, aligned along these value streams so that when you need to, and they may be different one to the next. Uh, but broadly speaking, they're centered around the customer experience and the core products and services that your uh, organization delivers. Uh, so once you begin to do that and look at things that way, uh, you'll find that a lot of the more radical departmental adjustments, uh, you know, be become apparent and become it becomes obvious why they're so necessary and useful. And I'm talking about uh, things like adjusting budgeting and finance and so forth. Uh, so moving into the next principle here, the idea of uh, big picture planning, but frequent delivery and uh, kind of smaller scale delivery. This is, uh, it, it was a local client of ours out in uh, Fairfax County, looking to adopt uh, basically support for uh, multiple languages more consistently, more holistically, uh, top to bottom in their school system. And uh, previously, uh, of course, the, the school calendar is based on uh, an annual cadence, and more or less this is the way that planning was originally done too. Uh, the problem with this was that, of course, we're talking about a lot of different things, everything from curriculums to, you know, to transportation to, uh, you know, printed materials. Uh, there are a lot of various areas where languages, of course, show up and need to be supported. Uh, and previously, this was honestly a bit overwhelming. There, there were so many different aspects of it that it was hard for people to get their hands around. And so what they ended up with is kind of the, the best solution that they could, they, something that was just barely adequate, if even that, for, for everybody. So something that really uh, was, was not great for anyone in particular. Uh, and this was one of the primarily uh, uh, adjustments that they made. They began looking at things in terms of scenarios, uh, in terms of uh, personas, looking at uh, their various stakeholders as, uh, as sort of different personas that they needed to satisfy. Uh, and picking some of the most important among those personas, they were able to more uh, have a more focused plan. And instead of trying to crack every nut at once and trying to solve these problems, which was simply impossible, uh, they said, let's try to solve the biggest ones for the most important stakeholders for now and do a really good job at it. Uh, and this ended up with a few really happy stakeholders and several others that, well, you know, just had to be patient. Uh, sadly, we can't always satisfy everyone all the time. Uh, so it's often a smarter play to do something more akin to this, to say, let's satisfy the people that we really must today and... Uh, you know, try to just get by for the others, and eventually we'll we'll get back around to them and help them as well. Uh, so, and you'll you'll actually see while I'm I'm calling this out for kind of the big picture planning. Uh, I also, the feedback loop is very important here. Also, the value articulation is very important here. Uh, so you'll see, of course, these principles reinforce one another and and are necessary together. Uh, as another example of this same principle, uh, at a very prominent bank in the area. Uh, basically, they were delivering uh, marketing updates, and these are, we're talking about internal updates here, um, so to, to associates uh, in, inside the company. Uh, they were delivering them uh, basically twice a year, and the problem with this was uh, it was a big deal to get together. Uh, sometimes the updates weren't really what people cared about. Uh, it came out so frequently, a lot of people just didn't read it. Uh, and so basically, they were, you know, all this effort often went more or less for naught. Uh, and following this, they took, uh, again, this idea of trying to get lots of rapid feedback uh, from people before they began, uh, and not just before they began the planning, but as they went along. And instead of releasing things every six months, 
uh, they began releasing things much more frequently, uh, but just a bit more than once a month. And at this stage, you know, they had people. Uh, Actually, people interacted with the process more because they were being asked, and because they were being asked fairly frequently, uh, they became accustomed to it, and uh, you, you had a more rigorous feedback loop, which led to a lot more trusted relationship among the employees, but also that everyone received more value. So happier, happier marketeers, uh, happier associates, uh, getting better informed about more current and relevant information. Uh, so a lot of this is the idea of instead of trying to come up with the one true solution, uh, you understand that uh, st strategy is more about directionality and it's more about having a, a notion that you can then put out there and find a way to test quickly as you move along. Uh, and this leads naturally into our next principle, the idea of uh, focusing on feedback. Uh, and again, I'm talking both internally and externally here. Uh, this, this first example is internal. Uh, we're talking about actually a local hospitality company in the area here. Uh, they basically had teams that were uh, initially a bit skeptical uh, of the idea that processes could be improved regularly on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, uh, that there, they would be heard, that their words be listened to, uh, that you know they, they could comfortably and safely give the, this sort of feedback without being seen as uh, you know, negative Nancy's or whatnot. And uh, but eventually, uh, the idea of retrospectives became a bit of a, uh, a you know quite the opposite from a an unsafe sort of feeling thing to a safety valve, and a way for people to uh, you know kind of let their feelings go, uh, but, but in a non antagonistic way because they knew that while certainly not everything would improve overnight, uh, things would get better over time, and that by simply having this platform. Uh, that they would have a way to make sure that things continue to get better uh, a bit at a time, which is, of course, what we're going for in, in most Agile methods, not uh, solving all of the world's problems in the stroke of a pen, but rather making sure that we have consistent attention uh, on the idea of solving problems uh, so that we can make steady strides uh, in, you know, in a positive direction as we move along. Uh, so eventually, these teams began to just pick this up and do this very naturally, uh, and the yeah, really the need for the scrum master role in general began to diminish because uh, the team members thought that way just intrinsically. As another example, uh, this is a uh, this is actually Glyphy is a company that does collaborative flow charting and process diagramming tools, uh, and they used it in uh, this is certainly one particularly rapidly growing area uh, and in their marketing function. Uh, so agile marketing is a thing these days. I, I'd say it's one of the bigger things in terms of having a, a, a title and you'll read about it not, not infrequently out there as a, an application of Agile outside of IT. Uh, here, uh, you, basically they had kind of a classic marketing function previously. They had uh, meetings between marketing people. Uh, they would have meetings between product development people. Uh, they would have meetings between sales people, uh, but those meetings never involved the people from the other meetings. So. What you end up with is quite a lot of meetings between people who uh, you know, don't really need to talk to one another as much as maybe they need to talk to people across their functions. Uh, and this led to a feeling of uh, kind of low transparency and, and, and low trust. And without trust, a lot of these other agile things become very difficult to accomplish. Um, it also slowed things down, of course, since you have to do a planning in one area before you feel comfortable handing off to the next. Uh, you know, people tried to basically dot every I and cross every T. Uh, often for things that really ought to have been left a, a, a bit more vague and uncertain in the early stages uh, until, in fact, they had feedback from the other uh, related and dependent functions. Uh, and finally, uh, with all this planning, there was still no guarantee that the efforts of the marketing campaigns, uh, we're talking about things from landing page design to website updates to uh, drip marketing campaigns and so on, uh, you never knew quite how they'd work out. Uh, so you have to launch and hope for the best. And we, you know. We, we'd rather not do that unless we're launching really, really often. Um, so what they did was they basically began to have more cross-functional uh, sort of get-togethers and less in big multi-hour meetings and more in daily scrums and occasional planning sessions. Uh, and they delivered three times as, as much output, uh, as many deliverables, which also seemed to be actually a bit better targeted than they were before. Uh, a lot of the meetings that were eliminated were ones that were actually reporting meetings from one department to the next. Uh, so this was both the time savings and the reason they were able to eliminate the meetings is because they had uh, a, a relationship that was trusting at its core between these various groups now. Uh, so they didn't 
well, they didn't feel they needed to be reported at quite as often. They were able to see what was happening as they went along. They had uh, physical task boards and things of that nature. Um, and this also meant that the stakeholders, rather than simply pushing as hard as they could because they felt that it was the only lever they had to affect uh, more frequent and better deliveries, uh, they, they, they kind of stopped doing that. They said, well, you know, we see why things are how they are. We had a seat at the table from the start and we still have it today. Uh, so opinions were able to be uh, kind of delivered and, and dealt with in a more real-time fashion. Uh, so at the end of the day, things worked out rather better there. Uh, and as you see here, this is both, uh, this is an example of both internal and external feedback loops. Uh, so I want to emphasize there that we really are talking about both trying to eliminate or loosen or lighten handoffs between parties in a company, uh, and we're also talking about getting out of the building, uh, lean startup style. Uh, there's another movement that's certainly gathered a lot of steam in the past, uh, not, not quite decade at this point, and uh, that's a lot about customer development, the idea of presenting things to customers uh, so you know, A, who those customers are, and so sometimes you make them customers when there were no customers before because your, your product or service never existed previously. Uh, so it's something where you have to, in fact, uh, develop a market yourself. Uh, that This idea of, of more rapid feedback facilitates both. Uh, just uh, right, right now, a quick pause. I haven't seen any questions come in, but if anyone has any now, feel free to go ahead and launch them in there, and I will, uh, I'll keep an eye out and, and begin to see if, if you need to answer them. Uh, and as you do that, I'll, I'll just continue, but I'll pause as I see them come in. Uh, the fourth principle is that of working together. Uh, this is really the idea of having, um, again, small cross-functional teams that uh, have some ownership and control over what they're doing. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna play this one out pretty broadly. I'll start with a small scale example and I'll, I'll begin to uh, expand this into a, a bit more of an enterprise view. So uh, in a, a, another actually local uh, hospitality vendor, basically we have the idea that in, in one of their digital marketing and branding groups, they had a, a lot of internal distrust. Uh, they, you know, people, there was a lot of sniping and, uh, you know, kind of re meetings that got acrimonious sometimes, basically because people didn't always know that uh, other groups had their best interests at heart or that they were uh, doing the job they were supposed to be doing. And this was largely due to simply a, uh, r really a lack of visibility and actually getting together on a regular basis. So they didn't plan together, uh, they didn't design together, uh, they didn't deliver together. So re really it was down to some very infrequent reports as to, uh, to, to understand where things were happening elsewhere. Uh, and so as one example of a particular practice being implemented here, uh, they started doing daily stand-ups. Uh, and as you can see from that, that photo there, that wasn't all they did. They did visual management systems. Uh, they also had sprint planning meetings and so on, but I'll just focus on this area. Uh, in, in the daily scrums, uh, they were they were initially thinking, uh, this is awfully often to have a meeting, uh, right? But it's one of the principles I'll raise at the very end of this webinar is that of uh, organizational disablement, I'll call it. And this is the idea that uh, when, when you're adopting frequent meetings like this, the notion is you're dropping other meetings. Uh, so you're not supposed to add daily scrums on top of all the other meetings. You're supposed to use them as a replacement. Uh, da daily stand-ups are meant to spawn many meetings between people who really need to have them uh, following the initial group conversation. And that's in fact what happened here. So they found that this daily conver conversation uh, gave them a platform to ask questions a lot more often, uh, to actually do something about the, the questions and the issues that were raised as things came, uh, went along. Uh, and it also led to them working together a lot more effectively than they did previously. Uh, and, and I think that's uh, that's kind of a core notion maybe perhaps a lot of people miss with the daily scrum in particular. The idea is that uh, that, that constant insight into what is going on elsewhere uh, often gives individuals insights into where they can contribute elsewhere uh, or conversely where they can ask for help from elsewhere. Uh, in, in many cases, and, I, and I've seen this in some pretty uh, starkly surprising uh, you know, uh, situations in some cases where you've got people working together literally for decades uh, at the same company who often uh, are, are shocked and surprised by the fact that one of these people they've been working with all this time uh, can, can help them in some way that they never even would, would have thought to ask. Uh, we often see other people really in the light of their job titles, in the light of their resumes, uh, and that's all we understand that they can do and that they're capable of, uh, and that's, that's of course almost never the case. People can do a lot of things that they're, 
they're not necessarily trained to do initially. Uh, simply through exposure over time, through collaboration with other people, they can uh, pick things up uh, j just as they go along. So that, that this kind of gives you the opportunity to see where value streams can be streamlined uh, and, and so on as you go along. As another example, uh, at The Motley Fool, uh, one of our uh, longtime local friends, colleagues, and clients, uh, they had uh, we're trying to deliver a human resource uh, plan. So th this is all around performance management. Uh, how are we going to do re reviews of people, uh, see who gets raises, uh, do bonus uh, sort of distributions and so on. And uh, they had, uh, you know, they had a leadership structure in place basically where they had come from a traditional organization and, and thereby were planning in a fairly traditional way, uh, delivering plans that basically were done uh, in a bit of a black box. They were done in, uh, in, a, in a closet, so to speak, where nobody else got to see them until, boom, they're launched. Uh, and as you might expect, uh, HR plans have a pretty good, big impact on people's personal lives. Uh, so this was, uh, th this was not the most popular thing. Uh, they, everybody was a bit upset about it. When they came out, there was always a lot of uh, storm and drong around what, what was happening there. And so what they were trying to do is uh, they turn things around. Uh, the, the, the company in general is uh, really quite agile in a lot of ways, uh, just in terms of its culture, its people, uh, at its core in many other areas. And so this, the idea of agility was nothing new to them. Uh, and they just, they had only to apply it in this area. So they did. They said, let's, instead of having these big quarterly plans, let's work in tight cycles, a, a week or two, and let's uh, prototype things as we go along. I mean, who are we showing it to? We're not just showing it to our HR colleagues. We're showing it to the people it would affect and saying, hey, uh, you know, how, how do you guys like this? Uh, ought we to adjust it? Uh, so they, in particular, many of the folks in the company had already been, uh, in fact, introduced and trained in design thinking principles. Uh, this is uh, from IDEO originally, an industrial design firm. And uh, so they were, this was basically the notion of taking an, an empathetic perspective, taking the company's and the, uh, the, the customers of the process, that is the, the employees in this, taking their perspectives uh, as they went along. And so now they've uh, evolved things, as you see, or a number of times, and this continues. Uh, I, I had a conversation about this particular thing probably about six months ago. So it, at this stage, I imagine things have continued to evolve. Um, it's a notion of just sort of testing things as you go along and making sure that you're, you're working across units. Looking more enterprise at this, uh, you'll, you'll see the rise of the idea of, of tribes, of, of squads, and so on. A lot of people associate this with the, uh, they, they call it the Spotify model. Uh, and while uh, there, there really is, is no such thing exactly as a Spotify model, because it's, it's different from one place in Spotify to the next, uh, e even there, uh, th this language is somewhat interesting and useful. The idea of a tribe is essentially it's a, uh, it, it's a redesign of the old idea of a department. Uh, so instead of the departments being essentially functionally oriented, uh, where you've got developers in one, testers in another, product managers in another, and so on, uh, you've really got all of those types of entities that have the respective skill sets you need uh, aligned against something more like the value streams I mentioned. Uh, they're, they're there and they have cross-functional control and representation. Uh, they decide when they're going to hire and fire people, uh, and people can move from one tribe to the next if they want to. Uh, so it, it really not only introduces and, and allows for, but encourages the idea of, of cross-functional representation, uh, of cross-functional mobility, um, and of really cross-functional ownership, uh, both of one's internal team structure and of the products or services that uh, one and one's colleagues are delivering. And uh, as one other you know, fairly radical example of this, uh, at Opower, uh, yet another uh, local DC area client of ours here, they uh, have tried out the idea of self-selecting teams, uh, not something they invented, but uh, something from, oh, you'll see down there, that, that book, Creating Great Teams, Self-Selection, uh, that they borrowed some of these ideas from. Uh, basically, they had a situation where, uh, as they were doing their, their planning that would have traditionally been done by an organization like a PMO, perhaps, uh, deciding who is going to work where and on what, uh, they had a, a group of their leaders uh, pull together a lot of the core initiatives and things that needed to be done in the company. Uh, they did some planning around what skill sets were necessary there and so on, you know, looking at what would be needed to deliver them. And armed with some of this information, which required uh, a few weeks of preparation, but they, they were able to come in and have a very rapid session, in fact, 
uh, to actually have the teams come and uh, decide on their own, uh, person by person, uh, where they wanted to go. Uh, and I think something interesting that arose from this particular idea was that, uh, aside from the fact that virtually everybody was pleased with the result, uh, the, the rationale for why they went where they did was, was, was pretty interesting. Uh, so, as I noted, the leadership team, the, the one thing that they more or less fixed in place before this began was that these are the things we would like to be done, right? So, the, the ideas of which projects would happen wasn't really up for bat here. Uh, but the idea of who would go where was. So, the fact that all these things needed to be done uh, was actually what led most people to go where they did. So, it, at the beginning, of course, it wasn't hard. A lot of people knew where they wanted to go, and, and that's where they went. And the uh, You'll see the second leading cause there of, of what caused people to go where they were was working with other people that they liked, basically, right, or, or wanted to work with. Uh, I, I would have thought that would be the leading cause if you, if you had asked me beforehand, so this was, this was honestly a bit of a surprise. But uh, what happened near the end of the session, and, and this is kind of what led to that, uh, you know, that 40 percent, was that there were some uh, unloved projects, perhaps, some, some ones that were not fully staffed, uh, and there were some people that had wanted to go into some projects that were already fully staffed uh, and were sort of left out in the cold. So that what they did here was they had to kind of separate and then come back together and they had a few personal conversations with these people, uh, with the respective sponsors of the projects. Uh, and what happened was people stepped up where they were needed, right? I mean, when the company said these are things that really need to be done and you know, you're, you're the person left who can do them, uh, People did what they needed to uh, for, for the company. And I think w with this sort of a structure, if you were to imagine this happening not once but on a regular basis, uh, that puts people more in the mindset of uh, if I step up now and, and do what the company needs me to do, uh, then the, you know, the likelihood is later on I'm going to have much more freedom and autonomy to go where I'd like to. So th there are a lot of interesting notions around this, this idea of working together. Uh, and, and I guess the message I'm trying to send with this particular notion is that uh, it's uh, it's not something that has to be solved as a problem up front. It's something that you can set up and systematically allow uh, people to solve locally uh, with some of the right information in place. Um, and, and taking this just a little bit further, uh, if you really look out organizationally speaking, uh, the whole idea of, of teal organizations and, and more broadly of the self-managing company, uh, which is certainly something many people are in, and many companies are going for these days, uh, You'll, you'll see there are levels of this, right? And a, and a lot of the ideas that I'm sharing right now uh, are fairly high level here. I would say they're up in the green or, or teal practice area. Uh, this particular diagram and this uh, coloration uh, kind of pattern here comes from a book called Reinventing Organizations uh, by a guy named Frederick Laloux. And uh, basically noting that the, the ones at the top end there are more self-managing than companies at the bottom end. And while in general there are situations where the bottom in there is not bad, but, but appropriate in fact, uh, the way the world has been going today with much more rapid change, more uncertainty, uh, you know, more risk across the board in, in many different respects, uh, you, you're seeing more of a necessity for companies to begin to try to uh, move up to a stage where they're, uh, they're able to move a lot more quickly. And a lot of this really requires self-management at fairly localized levels. Uh, if you have a big company and all the decisions are made at the top, this usually means lots of approval chains. Uh, it means a lot of disempowerment, the lower levels. So it means people are less engaged, uh, less concerned about the outcomes, more concerned about their uh, outputs and reports. Uh, and you end up with a company that's simply slower and less effective. Uh, so definitely working together. We're not just talking about teams here. We're talking about organizations. Uh, and, and you can you can get this you know, in, in a pretty radical area pretty quickly if you begin to think about it. Uh, this brings us to our final principle, the idea of keeping work visible. Uh, so this particular example uh, is from one of my colleagues up in uh, Canada, actually, and, and a client of his. And uh, he was noting it, it's a real estate development shop. So this was a, um, it's basically a company that purchases, uh, you know, old apartment complexes, office complexes, things of that nature. Uh, redesigns them and, and has people invest uh, upfront in those uh, in those purchases with the idea that they will then benefit from the redesign when they uh, go out and rent it. So it's kind of an investment group, if you will, sort of a small focused one. And when they began, they did things again in a fairly traditional way. 
uh, they had a lot of these different spreadsheets, basically, and uh, analysis tools that they used to, uh, to, to make their decisions. Well, where do we want to buy? Uh, you know, how are things going with our investments and so on? And you can see a few of those examples here. They're big, complicated, uh, lengthy, tedious things. Uh, tedious to create, tedious to read, uh, hard to interpret. Uh, so while the information there is not, uh, you know, lacking in value, so to speak, uh, the, the time frame that it took to do this is, is really damaging. When you're, uh, you know, if you're kind of thinking about flipping houses uh, from, you know, looking at HGTV and the like, you, you notice that time is always one of the prominent issues there. They're, they're looking at to, you know, try to get, get their investment in and get their money back as quickly as they can. Uh, so any delay here really is uh, quite directly deleterious to the bottom line, and they, they'd like to get a, away from that to the degree they can. So uh, what did they move to? They said, well, let's, let's stop having all these different people gin up their respective spreadsheets in their offices with their doors closed by themselves. Uh, let's create a, a single area where people can get together. Uh, they can plan together, uh, and, and they can use effectively one tool to do that planning uh, together. Uh, so as you see here, uh, there were, there's basically one a very, very high-level calendar, which is showing essentially the major uh, acquisition events uh, when, when they're going to launch some of the, uh, the redesigns and so on. And then most of the actual planning at the local levels is happening uh, on basically a uh, essentially a simple story map uh, is what it amounts to. So an idea they're visualizing up there on a board with stickies, and that's the plan. And this all took them a whopping half day to get to, uh, to move from the spreadsheets to this general way of operation. Uh, and, of course, it continued to evolve beyond that. But it's the point is it's not terribly difficult to accomplish uh, if the will and the way is there. So they uh, just to show you, this is the same example here. But they had a requirement specification, uh, the, the beloved by all, no doubt, that 100 plus pages, uh, the sort of thing that makes a dent in the table when they drop it. Uh, it takes weeks and weeks and weeks, if not months, of development. Uh, and uh, as with most agile software development projects, the fact of the matter is this is a guess. Uh, these aren't requirements. These are what we believe would be useful. And some of them are, are uh, certainly going to be on point, uh, but a lot of them may not be. And when you're talking about trying to get the most out of your money, it's, you know, it's important to not do the things you don't have to and to focus primarily on the things that will actually add the most value. Uh, so again, they've got one planning tool here to replace that big thing, and as you see, it's something that takes a heck of a lot less time to generate. Uh, this is a story map, so you're seeing there at the top some of the high-level ideas of uh, what they want to do. So this would be, for instance, uh, say, you know, landscape renovation. This would be, uh, you know, the in internal renovations. These would be uh, purchasing equipment and so on. Uh, all those sorts of things, interior design. And so what they're doing is they're planning it. Uh, as, a, as you go down this board, you get progressively more detailed. Uh, the, the top of it is basically the things that are happening in the near term. Uh, the things near the bottom are happening a little later. Uh, and they're, they're showing three separate releases. So this is a, it's a classic agile planning tool, uh, but it works uh, quite easily across domains. You have just basically a big picture plan at the top and the more detail down below, um, and you're showing a value stream more or less from left to right. Uh, so it's sort of the process people take. Uh, looking at a different example here, uh, this is again uh, back, back at one of the other companies I mentioned previously, that uh, an example of agile marketing at, at a large hotel uh, sort, sort of organization. They had uh, previously, again, spreadsheets that all the team members had to put together for the meetings and uh, eventually moved towards a process where similarly they created here a Kanban board and were able to use this uh, to do planning together and to do it in a much more lightweight fashion, uh, to do it more often but using less time and to have more ongoing visibility. Uh, so one of the things that a Kanban board in particular is useful for and the reason that you'll very, very often see this particular tool used in a, in a lot of non-software contexts uh, is it represents the value stream at a more granular level. Uh, so here you're sort of showing the things that need to happen uh, and uh, from a customer's perspective in some cases or sometimes from an internal perspective, uh, but it allows you to see basically where there are handoffs, where there are bottlenecks, uh, where there are uh, sort, sort of time gaps and traps in between various processes and between people. And that helps you to, to get back to working together more effectively. Uh, it helps you to get more feedback across roles more effectively. So you're again seeing uh, how these principles tie from one to the next. 
And so this brings me to uh, kind of the wrap-up to the end of the, of the program. Uh, and I wanted to just give you at this stage a few practical tips, uh, a few ideas about how we can maybe take this, uh, the, these high-level ideas uh, and begin to try them out more locally. So first of all, let me just say, keep in mind always as you're going along and implementing some of these notions that it's not just about uh, adding in the agile. It's about removing the non-agile. Um, it, it, it's about taking companies and trying to eliminate uh, the meetings, the artifacts, uh, the roles, uh, the silos, the, uh, the hierarchies and layers that, that we don't need. Uh, those are the things that slow us down. Those are the things that we're trying to uh, supplant, really, with, with agility, that we're trying to, uh, to, to replace with something a little lighter weight. So uh, it, it's something that a lot of organizations still fail at. Uh, you, you hear people saying, well, you know, we've got our daily scrums and our sprint planning. How are we supposed to have time for all these meetings, given all the meetings we already have? Uh, well, you know, you have to find a way to get rid of some of the other ones and uh, take some of the issues you're addressing there and see if there's a way to address them uh, in the existing uh, Agile planning structures, for instance. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. It can offer up a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit opportunities in many companies. Uh, just look where your time is being spent uh, at the most painful meetings, at the least productive ones, and usually those are good places to start. Uh, at an even more tactical level here, there are some notions, and uh, I, I will mention that these are ideas that I flesh out a bit more in the book that I mentioned that we'll be launching uh, in the not distant future, say the next month or two, uh, the, the Agile Leader's Guide to HR. Uh, these are some ways to begin to put the thinking in place regardless of what sort of context you're in, uh, so some of the more broadly applicable notions. Uh, this is by no means comprehensive, but just a few starting ideas. Uh, so first of all, the idea of saying, what is your value stream? Uh, that is if you look at from not your internal perspective, but from your customer's perspective, what are the things your company delivers uh, that are most useful and, and most prominent uh, from a product or service perspective? Uh, look at that and then look at all the steps it takes, starting from the customer's side of things, working backwards, what are all the steps it takes to get there uh, to the customer with that delivery of that product or service? Uh, that's your value stream. And usually what this allows you to do, and you can look into a specific constructs like value stream mapping for more insight into how, uh, or we, you can approach light speed and we'll help you with this. Uh, but what we can do is it, it allows you to see where there are in fact gaps between departments, uh, where there are steps that are perhaps unnecessarily complicated, uh, replicated, uh, where there are cues and time traps that are, that are not necessary. Um, it allows you to see where to optimize things. Uh, and it also allows you to see what is truly valued by your customer and, and really turn the focus of organizational improvement more towards improving that perspective. Um, when you have lots of departments and silos, what tends to happen is, of course, people look out for their own areas. Uh, and often that leads to uh, what you call sub-optimization, which is that you'll improve things in one area only to make the overall experience worse. Uh, so really this is I would consider this one of the most fundamental things to begin with. Uh, if you don't do this, you often will end up locally optimizing without ever realizing it. Um, the idea of story maps. Uh, this uh, really couldn't be a simpler idea. It's just saying, hey, you know, put everything up on the wall end to end from the customer's perspective uh, that we'd like to accomplish at, at a sort of high level, not getting into the uh, necessarily super detailed gory requirements. Uh, but really looking at what, what we need to deliver from the customer's perspective. Um, the benefit of this is, again, that it tends to break down silos. Uh, it allows us to do planning together instead of in separate meetings. And it, it also gives us an ongoing visual management system, which has uh, a, a lot of benefits. You, you'll be able to read about when you, uh, you know, hear about information radiators and, and, and other such agile, agile ideas, uh, scrum task boards or a similar, similar notion. Um, for this, I would recommend actually uh, Jeff Patton's book about story mapping. He's the, uh, the gentleman who coined the term uh, in a very practical kind of tone on how to go about that. Uh, there's the idea of looking at your assumptions. So this, this is going back, back to the value principle, the principle number one there. Uh, instead of saying, instead of assuming that you know what your customers need, uh, you know, write down what you assume. And, and really you need to begin to look at things like business cases as uh, completely resting upon and relying upon uh, the validity of these assumptions. Uh, many people, of course, have ideas about what they think is going to work, uh, and it just doesn't. Uh, that's, 
it, it, it's, it's no fault of their own necessarily. It's, it's often just the way the world works. We've got a lot of people with different ideas, uh, and the, our, our best notions may work and they may not. Uh, so when you're managing projects, when you're managing initiatives, uh, just, just make sure that you both surface these assumptions for all parties involved, uh, not just for your particular team, uh, for our, all parties involved in the delivery, uh, and then really use the agile iterative cycle to test them as you go along. And what this lets you do is to very rapidly replan so that you're not shocking and surprising your stakeholders with, uh, you know, kind of end of the line course adjustments or cancellations uh, after you've already gone a ways down the line and, 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 you know, had a lot of capital and time investment. Uh, there's the idea of continuous improvement. Uh, th this is really primarily around the, the focus on feedback principle here. Uh, but retrospectives, right? Again, it's, it's a very easy thing to do. Uh, and, and I think my primary advice here would be focus not on just the feedback, but on action against the feedback. Uh, that is the problem that most companies have primarily. Uh, things like retrospectives are meant to be a time for the team to say, uh, here's how we feel, here's how things are going. Uh, but more than that, the outcome that is intended uh, is that they change things, right? Is that they improve things as they go along or, or try to improve things. Uh, you're not expecting that everything we think will be, be an improvement will actually make things better, uh, but the fact that we're doing them at a relatively small scale and very often means uh, that it doesn't matter. It, it, lets, us, it lets us do a lot of experiments uh, and take really our best crack at things instead of feeling like uh, we have to dive into a state of analysis paralysis and, and get everything perfect before we change anything. So really, uh, the frequency is important here, uh, the cross-functionality is important, but most of all, uh, really, the idea of making sure that improvements happen is important. Uh, so that means baking them into your plans. And lastly, the idea of daily scrums uh, and, and, and sprint planning meetings. Uh, daily scrums are, are really quite good for, again, uh, eliminating other meetings. That, that, that was much of the original intent. And if you're able to get people together across functions to uh, not just share status, but to actually look for ways actively to help one another on a daily basis, you'll find this, this leads to more uh, poly-skilling, that is people picking up skill sets and, uh, and, and capabilities outside of their, their traditional domain. You'll find that that just begins to happen naturally. Uh, you don't have to force it quite as much. You'll find the process improvements and you know, the ability to smooth flow uh, from one group in one department or one process to the next uh, also happens a lot more naturally. So it's a simple idea, but it's, it's something good to start with. Um, with that, I've just got about seven minutes or so left here. I, I will note that I have left a handful of references for you. Um, some of these were referenced in the presentation, but actually many of them, uh, actually most of them were not specifically. Uh, so this is really other reading for you if you'd like to go a little deeper in, on some of these ideas. Um, with that, I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions that people might have. So uh, I'll, I will pause there.